All right. So everybody, uh, we decided, I don't know, half a third of the way through this. You'll, you'll get to that part. I'm not going to cut it out. Um, this, this episode, it's, it's a little heavier than I first thought it was. So we're just going to warn you now, uh, in this video or this episode, rather, we talk about, uh, uh, war and, um, political, uh, dissidents, some all around, not so happy things. <laughs> so if you don't like that, don't listen. Yep. But still subscribe and thumbs up smash that like button okay bye all right welcome everybody back to the real fishing podcast i love that game i know right that game like well okay i've never played it to be fair but i've watched you play it it's well okay let's let, okay i don't know if i love it anymore okay but I love that game as a kid. I mean, I, even I don't even like fishing. But why is it that every like game with the the fishing mini game, uh-huh. you know, or just fishing in it, like yeah. that's what I want to do, I even don't... though I don't like fishing, right? But in games, I don't know, like Final Fantasy fourteen, it's satisfying, and uh, Stardew, Stardew, and... And, and that's that is like that's a hot topic. Uh, yeah, 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 the, yeah. The, fishing the, and Stardew, fishing and Stardew. So uh, I know I promised last week a a spicy topic we said fishy even fishy um that might have been a little bit misleading okay just because i wanted to get you to watch the next one <laughs> i clickbaited you i'm sorry oh um no today today i have a prepared outline as i did with the previous one about um whether or not osama tezuka was a furry uh this one's a little bit less fun this is uh about the story behind the first joint Japanese-Russian film ever made. That's fascinating. It's it's a story. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a story. Is Manchuria involved? A little bit. Oh, of course it is. <laughs> Just a little bit. Not, I mean, you know, <clears throat> it was the time, you know. Oh, boy. This is going to be a humzinger. Don't worry. I'm going to... Humzinger? Gonna, I, How I, do you say that? A hum, humdinger. <laughs> That's stupid. It should be humzinger. Look... I don't make the boomer rules, okay? <laughs> so let's talk about some boomer. No, Ugh. no, they're older than that. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story about the director, uh, Yoshiko Okada, and and her story of how she became the co-director of the first Japanese-Russian film. Ever. All right. All right. So uh, Yoshiko Okada was born in uh, Hiroshima Prefecture on April 21st, 1902. So she's a little, she's getting up there in age, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Would she be 120 now? Yes. <laughs> Happy 120th birthday. In a few months. And in her 20s, she began acting uh, for Nikatsu uh, in specifically 1923. So when she was either 20 or 21. Mm-hmm. Um, and throughout the 20s and into the 30s, she gained her fame as an actress um, at Nikatsu as well as Shichiku. Uh, and she worked for famous directors like uh, Mikio Naruse, Yasujiro Ozu, and some others. And I literally just put, I wrote this outline like 15 months ago, and I put, and others. So they Et weren't cetera. the only two. <laughs> <Et cetera. laughs> yep. So the story actually picks up, though, when uh, Okada met and fell in love with a man by the name of Ryokichi Sugimoto, who is a stage director. And a prominent member of the Japanese Communist Party. Oh, boy. <laughs> as well as Here a translator comes. of Russian into Japanese. Oh, boy. And together, they decided to defect to the Soviet Union. Um, at the time that the two of them met, they were both married. Uh, but they To decide- other people. Yes, to other people. Uh, but they decided to... I, I guess that's not technically eloping, because eloping is when you go and get married, right? I think so. So they just, they ran away together, essentially. <laughs> Into the sunset. Into the sunset. Of m- Russia. Of Russia. Uh, earlier, in 1932, he had tried to flee Japan to the Soviet Union uh, alone. Uh, and he did that by sailboat. Um, but for one reason or another, I could not find a specific reason, uh, he did not make it. And he came back to Japan. <laughs> so The winds just... I guess. Whoop. Like, just pushed him back? Or, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know if he ran out of supplies. I don't know if the winds were not in his favor. Um, the stars are not in position. 
Exactly. So, in 1938, they decided to go together. Um, And part of the reason that they decided, besides their political beliefs, was that multiple other stage directors had gone before them and ended up in Russia. And the last that they had heard, they were all living there, like, either in or around Moscow. The problem with that is that they were going in 1938... And they did not know, because they were still in Japan, in 1937, all of those stage directors that they knew personally and were hoping to meet had been exiled to France uh, from the Soviet Union. So by the time they were going, there was nobody that they could get, get, get up with, essentially. Good. Yeah. So then they got caught by the Russian Border Patrol. Of course they did. Um, and they arrived right during what was called the Great Purge, apparently. Oh, that sounds like a very pleasant and healthy thing. Wh- which was Stalin's, uh, Joseph Stalin's way of suppressing anything that didn't agree with him and that he didn't agree with, oh, essentially. Oh, good. So they were both captured, and he did not make it out alive, to put it lightly. Oh, jeez. And she was sent to a labor camp for a decade. So she spent wow. the entire 40s. This is, like, depressing. There That's why be... I said it's not really spicy. There needs to be, like, a warning on this we'll, episode. We'll record, we'll, at the end, we'll record something and put it at the beginning. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> then, basically, she was stuck for, basically, the entirety of the 40s. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess that's one of those things where it's, like, whenever you're feeling down, mm-hmm. just remember... You're not in a Russian labor camp for 10 years. Nope. That's good. Yup. I, I guess it could be worse, right? <laughs> yep. So, eventually, in the late 40s, uh, so this is after World War II at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, so this she, is after her the place where she was born was bombed. Yes. So not only yes. has she left everything behind, right. lost the only person that she really knows, has yeah. been alone for 10 years. Yes. In a labor camp. In a labor camp. Yeah. And it wasn't clear... And her hometown's been nuclear bombed. Well, it wasn't clear whether or not, like, how much information she had at the she, time yeah, of what I was mean, going on in Japan. She probably didn't have much. Right. Yeah. I mean, because the infrastructure wasn't the same as it is now, but also, like... I'm sure Japan and Russia both had vested interests in, like... Not talking to each other? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Um, so, she made it... She was finally released in the 1940s. In the late 1940s. And she went to work for... So that means she was in her 40s. Yes. Because she was born in 1902. Yeah. So, yeah, she would have been, like, in her late 40s at yeah. this point. And she went to work for Radio Moscow because... In spite of being imprisoned for 10 years, she did not want to go back. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that is that's a decision. Deep-seated hatred. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> and, that's, and you thought you hated your hometown. Well, that's the other thing, too, that I found interesting is nobody really explored why she got to the point that she did politically or, like, how how she reached the opinions and the and the political beliefs that she did mm. early on that made her want to i mean you can kind of extrapolate from like the situation that was going on that if she was already left leaning and leftists like were not treated well in pre-war japan mm-hmm. eh, but nobody explicitly said why she ended up like well, that going. because that might be like making an assumption. Like if That's she true. never said, "That's true." I could see why any kind of like scholar wouldn't want to like assume, yeah, or or put words in her mouth, or yeah, something. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so then, in 1950, oh, but wait, there's more. <clears throat> there is. There's a lot more. We haven't even gotten the movie yet. I know. In 1950, she married. She she married. She married Shintaro Takiguchi who was an actor who worked on A Page of Madness, actually. Okay. uh, We have a video for that. He also ended up in the Soviet Union at some point. Um, And the reason that he ended up there... All right. This is a doozy. Oh, boy. You asked if Manchuria was involved. Yep. So he worked on A Page of Madness in... I think that was 1926 that that came out. Yeah. And in the 30s, he was drafted into the Japanese military and sent to Manchuria. 
And he was there at the end of World War II when he was taken prisoner by the Russians. And he also ended up at Radio Moscow after being released from Russian military imprisonment. Oh my gosh. Because he also didn't want to go back to Japan. He was like, I'm just going to stay here. Whoa. I'm just going to stay in Russia. Did they just really like the snow? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so. I mean, I, all jokes aside, like, I get it. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, sometimes you just do not align no, with where course. you were born. Of so, course. So, like, uh, this isn't me trying to make fun. No, I'm just trying no, to, no, no. trying to make this very deep and heavy episode a little lighter. <laughs> no, I know. I apologize. Apologize. There's I, no warning. I thought this was a really interesting story. Even if Your it's definition really sad. of interesting might not align with mine. So you want to know something else interesting in that regard? Oh God! So in 1952, because she was now the, the two of them were now working at Radio Moscow, and they're married. And they're married. A Japanese Diet member visited the Soviet Union on like a diplomatic trip. Okay. And met her. In 1952, nobody in Japan knew that she was still alive. Because they assumed that in 1938, when they ran away, both of them died. Okay, so, so it's for been 14, 14 years, years, nobody in Japan knew, and so he was the first but person like, why... to show up and be like, "Wait, what?" Oh, but because she was an actor. Yes. So like that's. So that... I, and I was he like, was why a... do they care? <laughs> and he was a stage director. Yeah. So like they were both, you know, at least moderately famous. Yeah. Um, and so that was the first time that anybody in Japan had heard of her in a decade and a half. Wow. That's. I told you it's interesting. I mean, like, if you want to fall off the face of the earth, go to Russia. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> but probably don't. Maybe don't. Maybe don't. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I've never been to Russia. I so. haven't either. But I don't know. It's big and scary and, and snowy. Snowy. Yeah. Yeah. So um, at that point, she began translating uh, stage plays into Russian and uh, from from Japanese, I should say, and also directing them. And that began in the late 50s. So at this point, she's been there for like 30, no, 20 years. Yeah. And she's in her late 50s. Yeah. Um, and so... She still hasn't made this movie? No. So she was starting to gain notoriety there as a, as a director at that point, okay. not as an actor and as a translator, obviously. Mm -hmm. So in the 50s and the 60s, after Joseph Stalin died... Uh, Nikita Khrushchev took over as the premier of Russia, and he apparently was a little bit more lax in terms of people disagreeing about things. Oh. Again, gross oversimplification. I'm sure historians in the comments will tell me that d defining what is known as the Khrushchev thaw as him being a little more lenient is probably not the most accurate thing. But for the intents of this story, we need to know that the types of media being produced and things like that were not as stringent anymore. Yeah. Like more things were allowed. And in fact, in the late fifties, he was the first leader of the Soviet union to ever go to the U S to meet the president. So because earlier Joseph Stalin had apparently asked president Truman to come to Russia to meet him. And Truman was like, why the fuck would I go to Russia? <laughs> Because it's like, snowy. That just seems, yeah. <laughs> you're just going to snow me in? Like, what, what are we going to watch movies and eat popcorn? <laughs> I don't know. Netflix and chill, man. Oh, oh my God. Is that, is that, is that the, the, oh, I've the always pairing? forget that that's actually a euphemism. Yeah. President Truman and, and Premier Stalin. <laughs> stop, stop, Netflix stop. And... No, stop. I forgot that it's a euphemism. So, because of the Khrushchev thought and things getting a little more lenient as, it's we're gonna say in our Cliff Notes version of history here. She was offered because of her work in translation and directing and stage direction. She was offered the opportunity to direct, to co-direct, I should say, the first Soviet film to not depict Japanese people as the enemy. So oh, it was kind of a big deal. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. And she was like the first to make a joint production. It's kind of a big deal, but it's also kind of like fascinating that the person who's going to co-direct mm -hmm. a movie about Japan not being the enemy mm -hmm. is the person who defected from, from Japan, Japan right, and hasn't right? wanted to return in more than half their life. I should also note, the film didn't come out until uh, 
1961. So wow. that was like 16 years after the war ended mm -hmm. before there was a sympathetic depiction of Japanese people in Soviet film, which is, I, I find that kind of fascinating too. There's a lot of strange There's a lot undertones. Going, right? Yeah. <laughs> See, that's why I said it. it's interesting. Oh, uh, yeah. So the film would be known as 10,000 Boys. Oh, baby. <laughs> it was co-directed by, and I apologize, I don't know Russian, uh, Boris, uh, I believe it's Buniv, and both Okada and then husband Takiguchi, the guy that she met at the radio station, mm. um, they both acted in the film alongside other Japanese expatriates living in Moscow and other Asian people who also lived in the Soviet Union. Because I guess they couldn't find enough actually Japanese actors. Oh my gosh. So they were like... Eh. Man, that's crazy to think about, though. Like, to be in a place where you can't even find enough people yeah. to... Like, to fill out a, a, a the cast, cast of a movie. Of a movie. Right? Yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, previous depictions of Japanese uh, folks had been as enemies... And they had all been portrayed by non-Japanese citizens. So the casting in and of itself of having actual Japanese people mm -hmm. portraying non-enemy Japanese people yeah. in a Japanese-Soviet movie. Like, all of that was kind of a big deal. Yeah. Uh, and It was novel. It was, exactly. And it was filmed in Georgia, which was, at the time, a Atlanta? Soviet Republic. Yeah, they, they got those tax write-offs <laughs> in Atlanta. Um, <laughs> and so the film itself, it centers around a boy named Tato, who, okay, it's going to get heavy again. I'm sorry. It's just pre Is this the Grave of the Fireflies shit? Kind of. Oh, I hate you. He acts as a doppelganger to a child killed in Hiroshima. Oh, my god! He meets a Russian violinist whom he asks to give him a pen pal, uh, because then the Russian violinist goes back to Russia. After telling Tato's story on the radio back in Russia, thousands of young Russians write to him, and he struggles to keep up responding to their letters. His American employer and, and a bar owner tries to sabotage this pen pal scheme, but is ultimately foiled. At the close of the film, the grief-stricken mother of the boy who was lost, declare, the, the one who was lost in Hiroshima, declares that Taro is her son and that 10,000 boys helped her find him again. What the f- <laughs> Oh my god! So, but of course, I mean, it's the Cold War. You gotta have the wily bad guy be an like American it. who tried- It's just like slipped in there. Just yeah, like, what? What, what a silly- <laughs> I was like, wait, it's almost what? cartoonish. I know. I was like, like wait, what? Hold on. <laughs> right, right. So, um, in other words, uh, the the film was constructed as a method of softening children's ideas on Japan. Now that the countries were no longer at war, but it was also displaying Japan as a victim of American imperialism, thanks to the atomic bomb, the occupation, and the lasting cultural mm. impact thereof. Yeah. So, like, there was a lot there's going a on. Lot happening. There's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of this. history. Exactly. Like, you know, right. So again. It's interesting. <laughs> um, and the film also portrayed the children as more or less politically active, engaging with their adults as peers when they can't directly affect change through, ta through Tato's letter responses. So again, encouraging the children of the Soviet, Soviet Union to be politically active. And yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was propaganda. Like, I mean, I mean, as... A lot of <laughs> yeah. I say. I mean, like a lot of movies, period, are propaganda. Well, yeah, they mean to be. I was gonna say, I, I, I say, as like one of the highest grossing movies of the summer was the Top Gun sequel, which you know got <laughs> almost all of its subsidization, I'm sure, from the Department of Defense. Like, yeah. So it's really easy for me to just be like, oh, it's propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everything is propaganda. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um. And originally, there was intended to be a scene in the film where Tato himself flees to Russia to be with his pen pals, but for some reason that didn't make it into shooting. That's because the sailboat pu got pushed back. <laughs> Bring it back around! <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, imagine being like, I'm done with my homeland, I'm leaving. And you pack all <laughs> your like, stuff. Like, and you're on a sailboat, and you're like, all like... Your, your friends are on the pier... <laughs> And they're, like, waving goodbye. <laughs> and then, like, you get, like, a mile out, and then the wind just goes, like... <laughs> and you come back, and they haven't even left the dock yet. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, that's not funny. No, it's not at all. It's a little funny, no, though. No, it's horrible. <laughs> so, uh, in 1966, the first co-production proper between the Soviet Union and Japan was uh, came out, and it was known as The Little Fugitive, which was directed by Tenosuke Kinugasa, who if you don't remember, was the director of A Page of Madness. Yep, I remember. And um, That was to everybody else, wasn't it? Again, I'm sorry. Well, this, this is to everybody. That's to me, honestly. Um, again, I'm sorry. I don't speak Russian. It was co-directed by Kinugasa and Edward uh, Bokarov, I think. Nailed it, maybe. But, so, that's why te- technically... That's the. Why first... did you say it that way? Well, because I know somebody, somebody who knows the history, yeah, might like technically me oh. in the comments. That film was made by a Japanese director living in Japan, and a Soviet director living in the Soviet Union. This one was made by a Japanese director living in the Soviet Union and a Soviet director living in the Soviet Union. So, like, you could argue that The Little Fugitive in 1966 was the first proper Japanese Soviet film. But this one came out five years earlier, and it's a really interesting story. So that's why we're focusing on this one instead. Okay. D- does that make sense? It does. Yeah. I mean, I don't agree with you, but <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Somebody's gonna say she wasn't technically Japanese at that point, or some shit. Uh-oh. I don't know, because she had lived there so long, or something. Um. So for a time after this, the details are really, really obscure as to what her career was. Like this is the last thing that's like really heavily recorded. Um, she had a few acting credits in the Soviet Union, but outside of that, it's really difficult to find information on her for like two and a half decades. Um, wow, she led a long life. Yeah, dude, right? Yeah. Like goals. Um, <laughs> Maybe not. Not <laughs> how she got there, but. <laughs> So, Takiguchi, uh, her husband, died in 1972, uh, which, okay... Let me guess, tuberculosis. So, actually, I did not find a cause of death uh. Uh, for that. But, so, in 1952, after she had been in an internment camp, or in, in a the, labor the camp... The 70s is a little too late for tuberculosis, too. But. I mean, people still buy, die, die of that, don't they? Yeah, but know. it wasn't like... As rampant. Like, it's like the... It was like... Between like the twenties and fifties, really wasn't it? Yeah, like really. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like like every movie from that time period. Oh my god! Is, like, someone oh, is dying of TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, sorry, Chandler. also goals. Uh, no. <laughs> no, well, because it's romantic. It's always portrayed. It as romantic. is always portrayed as romantic. Oh, you poor dying soul. Yeah. Oh, so it was in fifty two that she was discovered to be alive, and mm-hmm. people were like shocked. Yeah. Nineteen seventy two, when he died. That was the first time people realized that he was still alive. When he died? When he died. Oh, no. Because they had just assumed that he was killed in action in Manchuria when he was captured as a prisoner. So What the heck? So for 25, 30 years, people were just like, Oh, he's dead. Poor Takaguchi. But then he was alive. But but then he died. But then he was dead. And that was the first time she ever went back to Japan because she went back uh, for his funeral and remain there for a decade. Oh my goodness. But then she continued acting, appearing in a few more films in Japan yeah. before retiring in 1986. And so then she's 84 at this point. Yes. 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 Um, and then I'm sorry, I don't speak Russian. Uh, the restructuring of the Soviet Union. Uh, I think it's pronounced perestroika. Uh, which was envisioned by Premier uh, Leonid Brezhnev in 1979 and began properly in 1985 by Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the last leader of the Soviet Union. It was occurring within the Soviet Union. And after she retired from acting in 1986, she was like, quote, I am now a Soviet, so I want to go and live peacefully there. So she went back. Oh, my gosh. At 84. And she remained there until her death at 89 in early 1992, not even two months after the Soviet Union collapsed. So, right? Yeah. Like, it's like, it's a whole, like, narrative, which I I know. It's almost like her true love was the Soviet Union. I know. And when the Soviet Union died, it broke her heart. It's like, 
It's I, like the boss, except except not. Yeah. Because the boss was the opposite. With yeah. Was basically the entire opposite. But, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, no, I know, I know, it's kind of like, it's kind of potentially messed up or like problematic to say it this way because like we're literally talking about a person's life. Yeah. But it's like. That's a movie. Like that's a that's a narrative. That in and of itself is like that entire thing. Yeah. Is, that is crazy. I mean, what what a life. Yeah, right? What a life, yeah. Like, but you know what I love about it? What's up? She did what she wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah, she did. And that's really cool. Except that's like, for the ten years where Listen, she... <laughs> I know. I'm just saying, like, she pursued what was important to her. Right, right. And I think that's really neat. Which So I... we're basically not talking about the movie, are we? No, I Last I checked, which to be fair was a little more than a year ago when I first wrote this outline. Last I checked, you cannot find this movie. (gasps) Lost Media. Lost Media. Which, it could be wrong. It could absolutely exist and just not have gotten, like, a digital release. Yeah. I I will amend this in the, like, pinned comment with whatever the case is. Because, again, I haven't looked in, like... A little more than a year. Mm-hmm. I should probably have done that before we recorded, but I'm gonna do that now. So, okay. Key- keyboard noises. Um, but yeah. Also, I would just like to say, like for the record, I purely picked this because I found it to be a really, really fascinating story. Um, I'm not making any sort of moral or political judgment about literally anything that we talked about. I just wanted to talk about this because it was interesting. Yeah. So. You're not making any I, statement about your thoughts and no, your beliefs or your morals about or anything. Anything. anything You're just you saying, know. hey, look at this cool thing. Exactly. This is like you find a rock at the beach. Exactly. And I just want to show it off. I just want to show you. This, this yeah. really cool. Or why, why did you find a rock at the beach? Not a seashell. That's why it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. So, here, <laughs> so here's your beach rock. So anybody who knows more about the history of the Soviet Union, like, please, you know, add whatever you have in the comments. I only know as much as I researched because I know a lot more about Japanese history. And I honestly don't know a ton about the intersection of the two. Besides um, Manchuria. Besides... <laughs> Besides the Russo-Japanese War and Manchuria and, and I mean, World War II, because they were technically enemies, but, you know. Yeah. Good times. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> um, I hope everybody enjoyed this. I hope it wasn't too depressing. Uh, we're going to close out here, and then we're going to record a warning that we're going to put at the beginning. Uh, I'm saying that out loud so that I remember, and that will mean absolutely nothing to you who is listening to this right now, because I'm not going to cut this part out. Okay. Thank you for listening. Uh, If you are listening on YouTube, we are also on Spotify, where you can subscribe, get updates whenever we post. Uh, Right now, it's every Sunday, and... You can listen with your screen turned off, which don't even say, I know you're going to say you just use Firefox and you can turn your screen off on mobile with YouTube, but still try to get those Spotify numbers up. <laughs> and if you're on Spotify, go find us on YouTube, subscribe. We got tons of years, years of videos that are not uh, recorded on here on Spotify. It's great. It'll be a good time. There's a bunch of weird political stories over there too if that's more your thing um and almost all of them are just as depressing as this one stay classy and now time for a warning uh yeah i already forgot (laughs) 